Good morning, everybody. What a lovely sea of faces. Bank holiday Sunday. No, yes, it is, isn't it? Yes, I'm not too confused. So we join together today to come and celebrate communion. Um, we will be celebrating communion still in one kind, which means that you will receive the wafer. Um, but I will take wine at the altar, and it's sort of on your behalf. That's how it works. I hope that works for you, but that is how we're doing it at the moment. So uh, but it's lovely to see you all this morning. Um, notice this and things I will do at the very end. So let's just have a moment, and let's just bring ourselves before Lord. Let's bring ourselves before him in a, a sense of expectation. He is here, the Holy Spirit is here, and he wants to minister to each one of us. So let's open our hearts and our minds. Let's be open to whatever he is going to say to us. And let's decide to not leave this building without having been touched by our wonderful, beautiful savior, Jesus Christ. So we're gonna raise our voices because we can now, and sing hymn number 560, Praise My Soul. So from our Blue Orders of Service, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you like to sit or kneel as we come to a time of confession? We'll bring before the Lord those things that we have or have not said or done, that we have, have caused us to separate ourselves from others and ultimately from our wonderful God. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed 
through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, who called your church to bear witness that you were in Christ reconciling the world to yourself, help us to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may be drawn to you through him who was lifted up on the cross and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Song of Songs, chapter 2, verses 8 to 13. Listen, my beloved, look, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone, flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come, the cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit, the blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, Come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks.
The Gospel reading is taken from John chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus changes water into wine. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the serpents, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. When Jesus did hear, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went to Caponium with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Lovely to be back with you all, and sorry I haven't seen you for a while, but uh, it has been an extraordinary year for us at uh, Call to Prayer. Um, but here I am, and it's just lovely to be with you all. So, uh, hallelujah. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about Jesus in an aspect of him that maybe some of us haven't considered very much, and that's as bridegroom. It's often a, a topic that we can't quite get our head around. And maybe we understand Jesus more as brother, friend, Lord, King, Saviour, all those things. But how many of us actually really feel when we look at Jesus or pray to Jesus, he is our bridegroom? Do we use that term very often? I, I probably would say... No, we don't. We don't think about it. Maybe we also don't think too much about his coming back, which we should be thinking of. We declare it every Sunday because he is going to come back. I remember some years ago at college, because we, you know, we run a Bible college, and uh, I remember at the end of one term, I stood up in front of everyone and I said, next term I'm going to unpack the Song of Songs. And as I said it, in my head I was going, you idiot, you don't even understand that book. Why would you say such a daft thing? And of course then it threw me into a bit of a panic because I then had to dive into this book that is sometimes difficult to read. Perhaps some of you find, you know, what is this book about? How do we understand the Song of Songs? And I found that what, as I unpacked it, the only way really to understand it was to take every single verse, verse by verse by verse. And as I opened up the verses, this song became such a powerful um, message to me. I think I did 10 weeks of it, so you can imagine uh, it took a long time. But there was so much hidden in this song that was so beautiful. 
And clearly it's important whenever in scripture you see something of something, for example, holy of holies, that's the most holy place you could possibly imagine. Jesus is Lord of all lords, he's king of all kings. And this is the song of all songs. And this is a love song. Now we've got to understand that, you know, we look at things very much with this Greek mindset. But when the Bible was written, it was written to a Hebraic mindset. So it was different. They had a concept of God that perhaps we didn't start with. But of course, through Abraham and so on, they understood who God was and they look at things slightly differently. We separate very much the spiritual and physical. They don't. And when it came to the Song of Songs, they, they really understood this because to them, to the Jewish mindset, and today you will find this uh, with the, the, the scribes, in, um, the uh, Jewish scribes and rabbis that are probably the orthodox ones will say to you, but God married Israel. We understand the Song of Songs. The song is God's song to Israel. And we can take this song on three levels. We can take it as a man and a woman in, in, in a natural state, and that's good, and it's, there's a message there. For the Jewish people, they take it as God marrying Israel, and they will say that God married Israel at Mount Sinai, and that's backed up with his, uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah and so on. They felt he was their husband. So in that context, it's, it opens up a bit differently. For us as Christians, this is Jesus speaking to us. This is his song. In heaven, they're going to sing the songs of Moses and the songs of the Lamb. This is the song of the Lamb. This is the song of all songs. And even if we don't understand it, there's bits that we can understand. And I think the, the message today, hopefully we will. Um, if you think about uh, some of the, the way that Jesus was presented, especially, I'm going to just read from John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist, he's, he's one of my great heroes, of course, um, but he was the son of a Levi priest, and sometimes we can forget that. And this is what he said about the Lord Jesus. He said in John 3, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater and I must become less. You see, John understood this concept of bridegroom, and he knew that Jesus was coming as the bridegroom, and he was just the bridegroom's friend. And uh, I remember when um, Robert's uh, and Claudia's daughter got, they had a, a, a blessing here, and I spoke about the Hebraic wedding. Um, and opened it up and it's so incredible when you study these things because then scripture becomes more alive to you because you understand the context which Jesus and others are speaking out of and that opens it all up and that's why I love delving into the Hebraic roots of my faith because then I begin to understand it on a deeper level and uh, the scripture is so deep, isn't it? You can keep on going back and back to it and get more and more revelation as you do. Um, it, is, it is not uh, without reason that Jesus spoke a lot about weddings. If you look at some of the parables, there's a lot about weddings because he is our bridegroom and he has to come back because he wants to come back to fetch his bride. If you look at the whole of scripture through the lens of this being a love story, this is Jesus 
looking for a people that he can become one with. And that's perhaps a concept, because we think so physically, we, we just can't get our head around. But Jesus is coming back for us to be one with him spiritually. And of course, when you read the great high priestly prayer in John 17, may they be one as we are one. We're meant to be one with him. Well, what, what makes us one with somebody else is when we get married, isn't it? We become one flesh. And God, in his, because we're made in his image, he wants us to, in the natural, in the physical, enjoy what he is. He is father. So he gives us the ability to, some of us to be parents, most of us to be parents. But we all have parents, whether they're good or bad, we all have parents. So we've experienced this father-motherhood side of God. And for many of us, our children, uh, we love them with a completely unconditional love, even when they drive us completely round the bend, which they all do. I'll tell you, I have more sleepless nights over my family now they're growing up than ever I did when they were babies. I honestly, because they have children, then you worry about them and it goes on, doesn't it? But that's, that's actually what God feels for us. And when, you know, I, I unfortunately did not have a happy marriage but I know that's God's best. I know that God wants marriage. He honors marriage. And it's becoming one with somebody, and that is the picture of us becoming one with our, our Lord. It's a spiritual thing. And I don't know how it's going to work. None of us do. But I know it's going to be good. Because what we have in the physical is a dim reflection of what we will have in the spiritual. So when Jesus came, he obviously spoke about weddings because he was giving a message. If you, all the time when you're reading scripture, if you look, what is it really saying? What is the message that is coming across to us? And this is very powerful in John's Gospel. It is my favorite Gospel. But John did not repeat what the others repeated very often. He, he, in a way, he didn't want to just copy what they were saying because they said it so beautifully, he didn't need to. He picked seven miracles to speak about. And it's no accident that the first miracle was the wedding at Cana. It's no accident, because this is why he came. He came for a bride. And here he is at this wedding with his disciples, and the wine runs out. And that is a terrible thing in those days, because the onus was on the bridegroom to supply the wine. And what kind of bridegroom is this? He doesn't, doesn't bring enough wine. He's a cheapskate. This is how the guests could feel. And Mary comes over to him and says, Jesus, do something. Typical mum, do something. And he says, my time has not yet come. That's an extraordinary thing to say. My time has not yet come. And then he goes ahead and does it. Mums have a lot of power, don't they? <laughs> but why he said, my time has not come, because there will come a day when he is our bridegroom. And whether you like wine or not, I quite like wine actually. So I'm looking forward to this because you, you can drink as much as you like and you won't get drunk, you just get even more happy because you'll be in, in glory. And Jesus is going to provide the wine at that marriage supper because his time had not yet come for him to be fully bridegroom when he walked the face of the earth. But it's going to happen. It's going to happen. 
And you see, I know this concept probably is more difficult for guys. And believe you me, I understand when we think of a being a bride, we think of frilly white dresses. And it's not exactly very manly to sort of picture yourself like that. I, I get it. But being in love with Jesus is very manly. And it's very womanly as well. It's a different love. It's a pure love. It's a holy love. It's a complete love. It's something beyond anything that we could ever know. So, guys, you know, bear with us when we talk about you being bride. I don't mind being called a son of God. I'd rather you call me son of God than daughter of God, because I think we're all sons of the living God. Let's get rid of these sort of barriers in our mind, perhaps, that make things really difficult. So, you know, right at the end of this, this incredible story, this incredible Bible of ours, that is one story. From the Genesis to Revelation, it's one story. It's a story of a God who made us because God is love. And God wanted a people that he could pour this love out into, made in his image. And you see, when we look at the Song of Songs and we see her uh, starting off this journey, she says, ah, but I'm dark. It doesn't mean her skin color. It's like I'm dark, I'm full of sin. But he sees her as lovely. And this is, uh, he's wooing her all the time, telling her how wonderful she is, how beautiful she is. And he wants her to come with him. And she's going, making up all these excuses. Why not to come with him? And Jesus says the same to us. Come away with me. Come spend time with me. I don't know about you, but I make up excuses. Or something else seems really important that actually isn't important at all. Come away with me. He's wooing her. And the Lord wants to woo each and every one of us. Come into that place with me. And I will reveal myself to you. And that's what the Song of Songs is. It's this wonderful lover revealing himself because he absolutely adores her. And she's feeling unworthy. She's feeling uncertain. She's feeling unsure. And I'm sure all of us feel the same. We don't feel worthy, do we? We're not worthy of him. We can never, ever, ever, ever make ourselves worthy of him. He is the only one who makes us worthy of him. The onus is on him. We just have to accept what he's done. Because we can't make ourselves holy. We can't make ourselves pure. But he does by his blood and his forgiveness. And he never, ever, ever gives up on us. He woos us because he loves us. And that's what he's saying in this incredible song to, to his lover, to his bride. This is Jesus to you and to me. Arise, my darling. My beautiful one. You see, he sees us already made beautiful without sin. Come with me. See, the winter is past. All those things that have gotten us down. And my goodness, haven't we had a year and a half of things getting us down? It's felt like deepest winter at times. This COVID has been really awful for so many people. It's separated us from our loved ones. It's separated us in our opinions. It's separated us in so many ways. And goodness knows what the fallout will be. 
the, the mental problems that will emerge at the, on the back of this. We don't know the economy. We don't know. It's felt like a deep winter. But there's always in the midst of that winter, Jesus is saying, come away with me. Linda very kindly gave us this amazing picture um, of a lighthouse. And there's massive, massive waves coming over the bottom of this lighthouse. And there it is. And there's a little balcony. And there's a man standing on that lighthouse. And he looks ever so relaxed. And we kept looking at that picture. And that's exactly how it felt this last two years, really. That picture, the waves were coming. But the only sure thing in life is to build your house on that rock. And when the waves come, when the winter is there, come away with me. This year has been horrendous, as Robert well knows for me. It's been difficult. But in the midst of it, when we build our house on that rock, he will get us through. Come away with me. My darling, my beautiful one, the rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. Well, we're back to singing again. Let's rejoice that we can sing. We don't have to uh, come in here with a mask and sit and not sing anymore. We're allowed to sing now. So we're going to sing. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, my darling. Come, my beautiful one, come with me. We have to rise up. And I believe that all things happen for a reason. I don't know why this COVID happened. I get endless emails of conspiracy theories which I don't even read in. I really do not go down that path because I don't want to know. Because me knowing, is, I've just fed up with it. I want to seek his kingdom and him first. But I do believe that this has, surely we've got to learn a lesson from this. Surely we've got to say, okay, the world system collapsed overnight. Things changed overnight. It was extraordinary how quickly this all happened. So what is God saying? What does God want us to do as his people, the people with hope? How can we bring hope to a world that hasn't got a lot of hope right now? And I believe God is saying there's a new season coming. There's a new season for the church. And, and partly that's why I haven't been here. I've just been really wanting to know, Lord, what does this look like going forward? Because I don't want to be doing the same old, same old. In my ministry, in every aspect, I don't want to go back. I want to step into this new season because I do believe that in this new season, God has something for us to do. He put us here for such a time as this. You are born today because God needed you, every single one of us. He didn't make a mistake. And I just want to say to us all, let's see what season God could open up, what he could do, how the church of Jesus Christ, which is the only rock in the storm, make a difference out there. So let's not be downhearted. Let's look up, arise, come away with him, and move into the new thing he has, because he is our bridegroom. He is our lover. He adores you, and he adores me, and I'm never worthy of that. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, that you chose us. In fact, the Father chose us to be a bride for Jesus, even before you created anything, and that is extraordinary, Lord. But Father, 
We want to be those who embrace this new season. Jesus, help us to come away with you. Help us to spend time with you. Help us to know what this might mean for each and every one of us. Lord, as we go forward, as we want to make a difference in this world that has been so bruised and so hurt and so wounded, help us to be those that will really change things for the glory of your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. We're going to play a song now, and uh, just as we're listening to this song, the, um, Rachel very kindly printed off the words here, but just meditate on what it might mean for you that he is your bridegroom. So let's just uh, spend a few moments in quiet listening to the song. Thank you, Jill. In response to that message, let's stand and declare our belief in our wonderful God. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We're going to pray exclusively this morning for the people of Afghanistan, and I think that's right. Um, as dearly loved children and as the bride of Christ in this place, in a very blessed place, um, we should be thinking about um, part of the world where there is all kinds of things going on. Um, there's very little known about the church in Afghanistan, um, but um, many Christian organisations who um, have um, re some connections there say that there are Christians there. Um, they are obviously a very small minority. In the last week, there have been rumours that um, one Christian was skinned alive by the Taliban, um, that the Taliban have been seeking out Christians by looking at their mobile phones for um, traces of app apps that are related to um, uh, Christian um, uh, things. Um, and so I imagine there is a lot of fear there. Whether those stories are true or not, I don't know. Um, and it's very difficult to get at the truth of what is happening in Afghanistan at the moment. But what we do know is that we have a duty to pray for that country. Um, and we, although there is little known, we will pray for those who have managed to come out um, and uh, are seeking new life in other countries of the world. Um, one of them, um, Soman Nori, you may have seen in the news in the last uh, 24 hours, actually gave birth 
um, to a little girl, I think, um, on um, an aeroplane um, destined for Birmingham um, yesterday. So we will pray for her and the others who are fleeing that country at this time. Let's pray. Father God, as dearly loved children of yours in this place, as brothers and sisters of your church worldwide, part of the Bride of Christ, and a very blessed spiritually and materially part of your Bride. Lord Jesus, we pray this morning for Afghanistan. In recent days, we have seen the withdrawal of Western forces and the paramilitary overthrow of the government by the Taliban. We are deeply concerned about the unfolding situation for the women, men and children living there. Lord, you hear the cries and see the tears of those formed in your image, so fearful at this time. We know that politics, diplomacy and international laws all have an important part to play in creating and maintaining peace and stability. So we pray for international leaders and the leaders of our own government at this moment. However, we also see the limits of such endeavours. Human efforts alone cannot compel love of neighbour, let alone enemy. This is the transformational territory of your word and your spirit. So Lord, would you move your hand to change the hearts and minds of the oppressors in Afghanistan, even now. May they withhold evil and cultivate good, banish darkness and bring forth light. We declare your nearness over those who have been abused and displaced, violated and oppressed. Would you open their ears and eyes to your presence? Lord Jesus, we pray for your church there. Would you comfort and strengthen our brothers and sisters? As persecution draws close, would you draw closer still? Teach us how to respond as we place our hope in you and your good and just plans for your creation in Afghanistan. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father God, we pray too today for those who are leaving Afghanistan and finding a new place to live with all the uncertainty that that brings, all the feeling of betrayal that they may feel from leaving their country. And this morning we pray for Soma Nouri and her child we pray that you would give her strength in her new situation and that she may know your peace and comfort. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. great is the darkness that covers the earth, oppression, injustice and pain. Nations are slipping in hopeless despair, though many have come in your name, watching while sanity dies, touched by the madness and lies. May now your church rise with power and love 
this glorious gospel proclaim in every nation salvation will come to those who believe in your name help us to bring light to the world that we might speed your return <coughs> merciful lord accept these prayers for the sake of your son our savior jesus Thank mm-hmm. you. 